So at book eight, we finally get to the matter of the uh, celestial motions and the subject of astronomy proper. So having dealt with the sixth day creation and the seventh day in which God rested and the Sabbath and what that entails, all of which is very important, uh, but I had to pass over, uh, Adam inquires of celestial mo motions and is doubtfully answered. Now, why doubtfully answered? Well, again, Milton is reflecting, as all epic writers do, the knowledge of his day. And the knowledge of his day has cast astronomy in, in a certain degree of doubt. Uh, you've heard me talk about this in various classes. On the one hand, you have what the, the astronomy that is associated with uh, Ptolemy, the Egyptian astronomer, uh, which is basically an Aristotelian cosmology with the idea of the Earth at the center and the other planets around him and there's no motion and the movement of the spheres, by the way, is not considered motion. It's, it's, so it's a perfect uh, cosmos and, and yet there's a sense of a fall beneath the sun. So we see the, the effect of the fall and the changing of the uh, the moon and so forth. There's an influence there in terms of the constellation of the planets. This is the old way of seeing things. Uh, the astronomers of the 16th century gave reason to first doubt this and then dispute it entirely. And there's a wide variety of astronomers that you would associate with this. And as I say, the cosmology we associate with Copernicus, but there are others besides that that could be brought to uh, bear on the discussion because one of the postulates of Aristotelian cosmology is that the heavens never change. And what we find is that there is a, a Danish astronomer that observes a, uh, a nova in the sky, a change. Uh, likewise, Galileo with his telescope will demonstrate exactly the same when looking at the uh, planet Jupiter. We'll see four moons not revolving around the Earth, but revolving around the uh, orbit of Jupiter again. So we are not at the center in that sense. And he does it in a way that is uh, visible to other people. It's not just a one-off, I saw this uh, nova this new thing in the planets uh, or in the heavens. But now also we can observe that the, the Aristotelian view of the cosmos revol revolving on, around the earth must be wrong. And we can all see it through the telescope. And so with that, a shift in the understanding of cosmology gives way. And uh, that the ancient uh, proposal of Aristarchus uh, is revived and along with it, other cosmologies. Now Milton's going to name four possibilities here because he doesn't want to come down and say this is the way it is coming from the mouth of the angel, <laughs> which presumably is going to be accurate. And so we get something of him hedging his bets a little bit. Interesting, but it's not really in keeping with an epic. But Milton is again wanting to be truthful in his depictions here. And so to some degree, he is going to uh, hedge in his depiction of, of, of reality around him. So, uh, and, and when he gives doubtful answers, he's exhorted to uh, search things rather more worthy of knowledge, which is in keeping with what he said at the beginning of, back of book seven. Don't try and find out things that are upon your beyond your ability to know. It's going to only bring wickedness upon you. So there's a limit to human knowledge and you should know the limit and observe the limit and accept the limit. Adam assents to it and still wants to keep him and uh, talk about solitude and society, etc. And I'll get to that if I can in the time that remains because that we get it into a sociological, political discussion there at the end, which is interesting. So the angel ended and his, in Adam's ear, so charming left his voice. Uh, and he a while thought him still speaking, still stood fixed to hear. Then as new waked, thus gratefully applied, replied. So it's as if he were in a trance, as if he were in a dream. This knowledge was imparted. And replied thus, what thanks sufficient of what recompense equal have I to thee, rend have I to render thee divine historian, who thus largely hast allayed the thirst I had of knowledge and vouchsafed this friendly condescension to relate things else by me unsearchable, 
now heard with wonder, but delight, and as is due, with glory attrib attributed to the high creator. Something yet of doubt remains, which only th thy solution can resolve. Note that it's not doubt in the sense of Cartesian doubt. It's not a fundamental doubt. It's not the basis of knowledge. He's not predicating it on doubt, beginning with doubting everything and then beginning with himself. It's doubt on the basis that human beings cannot understand such knowledge. So, re so reveal it to me and I will receive it by faith. Just like it says in Hebrews that uh, we learn that by faith, God created the heavens and the earth. Hebrews 12 talks about by faith. By faith, God, we know that God created the heavens and the earth. Well, hold on, isn't it stated in uh, Genesis 1? Yes, but that's the book of Moses. Moses lived long after that. It's been given. This is the account. It's to be taken as a true account, but it is nonetheless by faith. It's not empirical observation uh, by an observer. Uh, other than God. God is giving us the knowledge of this. Anyway, so then he asks after this world of heaven and earth consisting and compute their magnitudes, this earth, a spot, a grain, an atom, um, with a firmament compared and all her numbered spheres that seem to roll spaces incomprehensible. For such their distance argues and their swift return diurnal merely to officiate light round this opacious earth, this punctual spot, one day and night. In all their vast survey, useless besides, reasoning I oft admire how, a, how nature wise and frugal could commit such disproportions with superfluous hands so many nobler bodies to create, greater so manifold to this one use, for aught appears, and on their orbs impose such restless revolution day by day repeated while the sedentary earth that better might with far less compass move, served by more noble than herself, attains her end without least motion. So how is it that all of these greater bodies move around us and we remain still? He, he's asking out of genuine curiosity, how is it that the heavenly, although greater than us, seem to uh, be moving around us as if man were the center uh, and fixed point in the cosmos. As tribute, such a sumless journey brought of incorporeal speed, her warmth and light, speed to describe whose swiftless, swiftness number fails, so spake our sire. And by his countenance seemed entering on studious thoughts, abstruse, which Eve, perceiving where she sat, retired in sight, with lowliness majestic from her seat, and grace that one who saw to wish her stay, rose and went forth among her fruits and flowers to visit how they prospered, bud and bloom her nursery. And they at her coming, sprung and touched by her fair tendons, gladlier grew. She went, she not. Yet went she not, as not with such discourse delighted, or not capable her ear of what was high, such pleasure she reserved, Adam relating her sole auditress. Her husband, the, the relator, she preferred before the angel, and of him to ask, chose rather. He, she knew, uh, he she knew would intermix grateful digressions and solve high dispute with conjugal caresses from his lip, not words alone pleased her. Oh, when meet now such pairs in love and mutual honor joined. This is Milton. Where do we ever meet an Adam and Eve that are so paired like this? With goddess-like demeanor forth she went, not unattended, for on her as queen a pomp of winning graces waited still, and from about her shot darts of desire into all eyes to wish her still in sight. And Raphael, now to Adam's doubt, proposed, benevolent and facile, thus replied, to ask or search, I blame thee not, for heaven is as the book of God before thee set, wherein to read his, his wondrous works and learn, uh, wherein, uh, and learn his seasons, hours, or days, or months, or years. This to attain, whether heaven move or earth, imports not, if thou reckon right. The rest from man or angel the, the great architect did wisely to conceal, and not divulge his secrets to be scanned by them who ought rather admire. 
So the heavens were there for our admiration, not our full knowledge. Note that. It's not knowledge that will submit to you. It's knowledge sufficient for you to do what you need to do, which is to admire and to understand that it relates to you. What you admire actually serves you. Or if they list to try conjecture, he his fabric of the heavens hath left to their disputes, perhaps to move his laughter at their quaint opinions wide hereafter, when they come to model heaven and calculate the stars, how they will wield the mighty frame, how build, unbuild, contrive to save appearances, how gird the sphere with centric and eccentric scribbled or cycle and epicycle, orb and orb, already by thy reasoning this, I guess who art to lead thy offspring, and supposed that bodies bright and greater should not serve the less not bright, nor heaven such journeys run, earth sitting still, when she alone receives the benefit. Consider first that great or bright infers not excellence. The earth, though in comparison of heaven, so small, nor glistering, may of solid good contain more plenty than the sun that barren shines, whose virtue on itself works no effect. But in the fruitful earth, there first received his beams, unactive else, their vigor find. Yet not to earth are those bright luminaries officious, but to thee, earth's habitant, and for the heaven's wide circuit, let it speak the maker's high magnificence, who built so spacious and his line stretched out so far that man may know he dwells not on his own, an edifice too large for him to fill, lodged in a small partition, and the rest ordained for uses to his Lord best known. The swiftness of those circles attribute, though numberless, to his omnipotence, that to corporeal substances could add speed almost spiritual. Me thou thinkst not slow, who since the morning star set out from heaven where God resides, and ere midday arrived in Eden, distance inexpressible by numbers that have name. But this I urge, admitting motion in the heavens, to show invalid that which thee to doubt it moved. Not that I so affirm, Though so it seem to thee who hast thy dwelling here on earth, God, to remove his ways from human sense, placed heaven from earth so far that earthly sight, if it presume, might err in things too high and no advantage gain. What if the sun be centered of the world and the other stars by his attractive virtue in their own incited dance about him various rounds, their wandering course, now high, now low, then hid, retro progressive, retrograde, or standing still. In six thou seest, and what if seventh to these the planet Earth, so steadfast though she seem, insensibly three different motions move, and so forth. So now he gets into questioning the whole field of astronomy and with it astrology. Now astrology is actually uh, it spins out of the field of astronomy. The desire to know what is going to happen in the future on the basis of the constellation of the planets, very common in the 16th century and even into the 17th century, such that the courts of Europe actually employed astrologers to try and tell them what was going to happen in human history, that the birth of their children would be uh, under certain stars and would, would it, this would be the future of my son or my daughter. And I could know what to expect and how to act as, as ruler, as if we were rulers without, uh, without guidance from God. Uh, Milton says this is all folly. To try and base your knowledge on stars of which you know so little and can know so little, and to act as if it were a science uh, that you could plumb the depths of is beyond your abilities. So don't get involved in that sort of speculation. See it for what it is and don't move beyond that. So it's wise counsel from the angel. And he moves on from that to ask about other things. And he talks about male and female light here. I'll skip over all that. But he's cleared of doubt and he asks, 
um, about um, uh, what is this about society and so forth. Uh, let's go to 360. Where is it? There it is. By what name? For thou art above all these, above mankind, or aught than mankind higher, surpasses far my naming. How may I adore thee, author of this universe, and all this good to man, for whose well-being so amply and with hands so liberal thou hast provided all things? But with me I see not who partakes. In solitude, what happiness? Who can enjoy alone? Of all, or all enjoying, what contentment find? Thus I presumptuous. This is what Adam said to God initially. And the vision bright, as with a smile more brightened, thus replied, What thou callst, what callst thou solitude? Is not the earth with various living creatures in the air replenished, and all these at thy command to come and play before thee? Knowest thou not their language and their ways? They also know, and reason not contemptibly with these find pastime and bear rule. Thy realm is large. So spake the universal Lord and seemed so ordering. I with leave of speech implored and humble de deprecation thus replied. So Adam is now uh, recounting what he had said to God in the beginning before Eve was created uh, about solitude and about society. So these are going to bear on political discussions. Let not that my words offend thee, heavenly power, my maker, be propitious while I speak. Hast thou not made me hear thy substitute and these inferior far beneath me set among unequals? What society can sort? What harmony or true delight, which must be mutual in proportion due, given and received, but in disparity, the one intense, the other still remiss, cannot well suit with either, but soon prove tedious alike. A fellowship, I spoke, such as I seek, fit to participate all rational delight, wherein the brute cannot be human consort. They rejoice each with their kind, lion with lioness, so fitly them in pairs thou hast combined. Whereto the Almighty answered, not displeased, not displeased. A nice and subtle happiness I see thou to thyself proposed. In the choice of thy associates, Adam, and wilt taste no pleasure, though in pleasure, solitary. What thinkst thou then of me, and this my state? Seem I to thee sufficiently possessed of happiness, or not? Who am alone from all eternity? For none I know, second to me or like, equal much less. How have I them then with whom to hold converse save with the creatures which I made and those to me inferior. Infinite descents beneath what other creatures are to thee. He ceased. I lowly answered to attain the height and depth of the eternal ways. All human thoughts come short. Supreme of things, thou in thyself art perfect and in thee is no deficiency found. But not so is man. But in degree the cause of his desire by conversation with his like to help or solace his defects. No need that thou shouldst propagate already infinite and through all numbers absolute, though one. But man by number is to manifest his single imperfection and beget like of his like, his image multiplied in unity defective, which requires collateral love and dearest amity. Thou in thy secrecy, although alone, best with thyself accompanied, seeks not social communication, yet so pleased, canst raise thy creature to what height thou wilt of union or communion deified. I by conversing cannot these erect from prone. I can't make the animals stand up and talk, nor in their ways complacence find. Thus I been bold and spake, and freedom used, permissive, and acceptance found, which gained this answer from the gracious voice divine. Thus far to try thee, Adam, was I pleased, and find thee knowing not of beasts alone, 
which thou hast rightly named, but of thyself, expressed, expressing well the spirit within thee free, my image not imparted to the brute, whose fellowship therefore unmeet for thee. Good reason was thou freely shouldst dislike, and be so minded still. I, ere thou spakest, knew it was not good for man to be alone. And no such company as then thou sawest intended thee, for trial only brought, to see how thou would, couldst judge to fit and meet. What next I bring shall please thee. Be assured, thy likeness, thy fit help, thy other self, thy wish, exactly to thy heart's desire. He ended, or, or I heard no more. For now my earthly by his heavenly overpowered, which it had long stood under, strained to the height in that celestial colloquy, sublime and with an object that excels the sense. It's okay. Dazzled and spent, sunk down and sought repair of sleep, an inst that which instantly fell on me, called by nature as an aid, and closed mine eyes. Mine eyes he closed, and but open left the cell of fancy, my internal sight, by which abstract, as in a trance, methought I saw, though sleeping, where I lay, and saw the shape still glorious before whom awake I stood, who stooping over, opening, opened my left side and took from thence a rib with cordial spirits warm and life blood streaming fresh. Wide was the wound, but suddenly with flesh filled up and healed, the rib he formed and fashioned with his hands. Under his forming hands a creature grew, manlike but different sex, so lovely fair, that what seemed fair in all the world seemed now mean, or in her summed up, in her contained and in her looks which from that time infused sweetness into my heart unfelt before, and into all things from her air inspired the spirit of love and amorous delight. She disappeared and left me dark. I waked to find her and forever to deplore her loss and other creatures, pleasures that all abjure. When out of hope, behold her, not far off, such as I saw her in my dream, adorned with what all earth or heaven could bestow to make her amiable on she came, led by her heavenly maker, though unseen, and gar guided by his voice, nor uninformed of nuptial sanctity and marriage rites. Grace was all in her steps, heaven in her eye, and every gesture dignity and love. I overjoyed, could not forbear aloud, etc. And she heard, etc. I'm going to, I'll leave the rest to you because I'm out of time. The creation of Eve, told by Adam. Extraordinary passage, but note how there's a discussion here of solitude and society. Very important political subjects. Very important. Privacy and the benefits thereof. Society and the benefits thereof. Uh, remember, Satan says that the mind's its own place. Satan is a self-regarding being. He sees no importance to society. It's all around, it all surrounds him. This is the sinful mind. Adam recognizes that there's a good in society, but also that there's a, uh, something lacking uh, in, in society, but also in solitude. He wants to render both its due. In a sense, he's already talked about that in uh, L'Allegro and Il Penseroso as well, right? The solitary life, the active social life, he's giving them both their due. Again, uh, playing on notes that he's already uh, touched on in his poetic corpus. So next time, book nine, we will get to the fall proper, okay? And I shall see you then.